Bonjour, Lexil fans. This is Melis Brunet, and I am so happy to have with me today our fantastic soloist, Jordan Bach. Hi, Jordan. Hello, Melis. So nice to meet you and really looking forward to meeting you all at Lexville. We are, we are so happy to have you. I have a few questions for you so the, our audience can get to know you more. You are a fantastic, amazing, young, talented viola player. That's pretty intimidating and that's a great opportunity for our audience and our community to get to know you in town, in Lexington. Where were you born and where do you live? So I was born in New York, in Queens, New York, and currently I live in Toledo, Ohio. Oh, wow. Fantastic museum, yes. right? Yes, a really, really great art museum. Wonderful. Can you tell us what is a viola? Well, a viola is a string instrument, of course, belonging to the violin family. It's really the middle voice in our wonderful orchestra and string family. It's played a lot like a violin, slightly bigger than a violin, but tuned up a fifth lower. So unfortunately, we don't have an E string to use, but we do share with our celli the wonderful C string that we love so, so, so much. Wonderful. Why did you, did you pick viola at first? And why did you choose to play the viola? I actually didn't start on the viola, but I also did not start on the violin. Um, so I started my musical life, musical journey um, on the piano. And so I started taking lessons when I was about three years old. I was very young and very ambitious. And I, I continued on with that really throughout um, my K-12 high school orchestra training, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't pick up the viola until I was about eight. And I should tell you, it was not by choice. I really wanted to play the violin. And so when the opportunity came to have group music lessons in my New York public school, I chose, I had to pick four different instruments that I'd like to play for, first ever group music class. And so I picked the violin first, right? Because as, as an eight-year-old United States, New York, everybody wants to play the violin. So I wanted to be one of those cool kids that played the violin because that was, in my mind, that was ma what made me, you know, achieve status in my third grade class, right? I think I picked the viola as the second choice, actually, not the cello. I knew vaguely what it was. I had heard the word before, but it wasn't really, you know, something that I had profound interest in. Cello, I think, was number three for me. And I think it was either clarinet or trumpet or something like that, a, a wild card instrument that was not a string instrument for number four. Anyway, the results came and I did not get a violin because by the time they get they got to me anyway, they must have shuffled the papers or something because you'd think with the last name like Bach, I would be closer to the top. <laughs> but I guess that didn't happen. And so there were no violins left, unfortunately. And I was a very heartbroken eight-year-old with a viola that I didn't really consider to be a real instrument. I thought it was like a fake violin. And so I lived my first like three years between eight and 11 thinking this isn't the real thing. <laughs> this is genuinely not a real. I was heartbroken. I was about, I was very miserable just to start out. But, you know, I somebody had to do it, right? There were only two violas in the entire school and somebody had to play this thing. So I said, well, well fine. I mean, I have to get through the elementary school. So fine. It wasn't until actually my teenage years that I was recruited um, to be part of a youth orchestra in Long Island called the Children's Orchestra Society, which I was very happy to be a part of through, I would say about 13 until my leaving for a conservatory. And it was during that point where I began to have regular lessons, which was something on the viola that I had not had because I was so busy spending so much time on the piano, and also the financial constraints with maintaining both instruments. And that was my first bit of really regular lessons, um, chamber music, youth orchestra instruction, first of all, playing in a full orchestra with winds and brass and percussion, that wasn't anything that I was used to. And wonderful guest artists that came and played concerti and led master classes. And I was so in love with that, first of all, just to have that opportunity. And second of all, it changed what the viola meant to me. You know, it was like a complete 180 degrees of this isn't the real instrument or this isn't the real thing to actually, yeah, it's not a violin at all. It's its its own instrument with its own voice that I deeply resonate with. And I would be so happy to make this my career. And so after that, of course, that was, you know, my journey into studying and, and being a professional violist full time. And being in love with viola. Absolutely. <laughs> 
I love your story. You know, it's, <laughs> it's so powerful. And, you know, I think too many people do not know exactly what Viola is. And that's why I like to ask you this question. Yes. Do you have words for any young kid between eight or 11 years old or any other age that would have to play the viola and would not feel good? What is your message for them? Well, you know, the, the best thing I found about the viola is, first of all, that it's, it is the middle voice and it's so beautifully close to our speaking and singing voice. So I encourage them to just have the curiosity to explore that within an instrument that maybe they may not like at the very beginning, but the more they develop and continue their time with that instrument, I think that hopefully the curiosity will start to open a little bit and develop that, that sound that is just so incredible about it. And second of all, I think because it's it's, you know, in my later experiences of playing, it's actually quite an imperfect instrument. But in my experience of playing, I've been able to make all sorts of different sounds with the viola that aren't so traditional. You know, so we're sort of, we love to listen to amazing symphonies with all the strings, with their beautiful luscious sound and the beautiful vibrato. Some of the things that are currently being written, especially with contemporary music, are all sorts of all over the place. You can whisper on the viola, you can growl on the viola, you can do all sorts of imitations, like imitating animal sounds, like birds or you know, amazing, amazing possibilities that aren't part of sort of our regular making in terms of sound. And I absolutely love that about this instrument. Yes. And your last CD recording, I think it's called Impulse. It's shows called Impulse. All, yes. It shows gr the great ambitious and uh, great things that you can play and different moods on the viola. So I recommend everybody to go check it everywhere. It's on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you can find it. YouTube music, all of the above. Thank Thank you. What is your favorite dish? Oh, well, um, being that I am have Caribbean heritage, my family's from Jamaica, I love um, Jamaican curry chicken. The way that I make it is, well, we have all sorts of spices in the Caribbean, but um, I absolutely love using Jamaican curry powder, um, lots of hot peppers, scotch bonnet peppers, tomatoes, onions, garlic, thyme, and just all of the different flavors together with with a really great rice and peas and stewed cabbage is one of my favorite things that I remember, you know, from home. And it's something that I keep in, you know, making. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful dish. And it's so comforting, just really one of the best soul foods. Wow, you sound like a great cook as well. <laughs> So maybe we will, I will need to. <laughs> we'll have to cut to me in the kitchen. That's <laughs> my your, your dish. Tell me about your cats, because I've heard you've got cats with your wife, and your wife is also a viola player. She's also a viola player, yes. So we have two cats at home, and their names are Bartok and Walton. So I'm thrilled to be joining for the former. Um, so Bartok was, he grew up in New York. He was a stray cat, actually, um, and he was you know, outside of my family's home in Queens and always just wanted to be a part of humans and always wanted to go up and and cuddle, ask for food or any sort of thing. And, you know, ultimately we decided that we wanted to take him in and we took him in at six months old and he went from, you know, the little stray cat. He is a domestic short hair. He is a ginger. Um, beautiful sort of orangey coat and he's turned from that into some like one of the most high class cats I've ever seen he has such a personality but he still has these wonderfully big eyes but a very small face um, and so he looks like a doll all the time but he gets away with it. He really does. He He's built like these routines. Like he loves to, at probably 10 o'clock in the morning, he'll go and watch, sit by the window and look outside at the birds. And he has his own thing going on. Walton is the other one. Um, he's a little bit younger. He is also a, a domestic, but he's half domestic and half Russian blue, actually. So he has the coat, the wonderful gray coat, but he doesn't have the eyes. But what he makes up for without the eyes is the personality. So he is rambunctious. He is a rascal. He, I think he exists only to disrupt Bartok's routines. So when Bartok is busy with his own activities, Walton comes and beats him up because he needs to just rustle his feathers a little bit. Um, when they're both feeding, when they both have their meal time, Bartok is very dainty and he loves to eat and take his time. Walton will shovel the entire thing in his mouth and then push Bartok out of the way and try to get at Bartok's food 
anyway, so then Bartok starts to meow at us and ask us for help because he's been he the food has been stolen from him. It's a whole saga in our house. They love to run around, but they really, really just a joy to have in the house. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you just tuned in now, we are talking about cats. <laughs> However, I know why, but can you explain our audience what does it refer to Bar to name your cats as two viola players to name them Bartok and Walton? Oh, yes. It, well, of course, you know, it's because of the Bartok viola concerto, of course, that I will be joining Luxville for, which I'm very excited about, is whom Bartok is named after and then the Walton for the Walton viola concerto. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> I'm sure you are never bored at home. <laughs> <laughs> My next question is, can you tell us about now the Bartok composer, not Bartok the cat, but Bartok the composer, his viola concerto, it has a very, very special history. Can you talk to us about it? Oh, of course. Well, of course, it was one of the very last pieces that he wrote in his life. Um, and he did, you know, he finished the solo part, but the orchestration was just in all sorts of different notes. And he had passed away before finishing that particular part of the, the concerto. Um, of course, in his letters to William Primrose, um, it's, you know, of course, Primrose is a really a amazing, amazing and very important violist and for us all. But that is what really existed. Um, and then the rest are really sketches that were kind of compiled together and some of previous Bartok's ideas by Tibor Surly, who were performing the Surly edition for the concerto. But since then, there have been several other versions of that and understandings of, you know, perhaps Bartok's past compositions, um, his influences, his writings, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But really, um, completing a piece that was actually not totally completed before he passed away. So we're kind of going off in some senses of remnants left by him and piecing things together to create such a magical and important piece in the viola repertoire. Yes, uh, thank you for this background. And you have mentioned William Primrose, uh, to whom the, the, for whom the Viola Concerto was written. And I want to show everybody this great book that, of course, you do know, uh, playing the viola, it's conversation with William Primrose. And I Absolutely. think David Dalton, unfortunately, just passed maybe a he month. He did just pass away, David Dalton. Yes, and it's a fantastic book for any string players, I would say, not only viola player, and also, uh, of course, conductors uh, and he mentions at one point about the Bartok concerto that the fact that uh, it was not totally finished yes. he has altered some fingerings and some harmonies as well yes do you, do you see yourself at one point creating your own edition of the concerto and have you already made some changes that are very personal and unique changes Oh, certainly. Um, I think during, you know, during, of course, my studies as a violist all the way from the undergraduate level and beyond and working with so many different teachers and also my own research in terms of the, the solo part and the orchestral part and alongside the different editions, I've certainly made some changes within the solo part to reflect that in the Surly edition. Um, there are some registral changes that might reflect a, a little bit more clear of a solo line that might not be present in that particular edition, but does exist somewhere else. But but there it's it's very interesting because it's a dialogue that all of us violists have, especially because it's what it's become really is such a standard piece within our repertoire. Um, but in in its unique position that it hasn't quite been finished before Bartok's um, unfortunate death, but it's it's something that is always going to be a work in progress. And, you know, it's something that I might change my mind in perhaps in the next 10, 15, or however, however so many years really, but it's it's a really interesting ongoing project as to what to reflect, what I'd like to reflect in a particular performance and beyond. I, I find it personally, it must be so exciting because it gives so much freedom and creativity and the opportunity to change. Yes, absolutely. And creativity is something that we, we so thrive on, especially when presenting something like this work to our wonderful audience. Absolutely. How do you prepare, talking about our audience, how do you prepare for your performance of the Bartok with the Lex film? I think for, for myself, my own preparation for the Bartok with Lex Phil comes first and foremost from Lex Phil, from really the orchestral part and the score and how the solo part reflects everyone else kind of cultivating um, this, you know, this wonderful ensemble and, and to curate you know, an orchestra as a unit and the solo part within that unit. So perhaps I think of it as a bit more like chamber music than, you know, 
solo violist and orchestra. In terms of the solo playing, first of all, looking at the 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 real concerto as like a giant arc in terms of the movements um fortunately i guess for this concerto they aren't broken up into three they are broken up into three movements but let's say but not with pauses in between so they kind of run as if it is one giant work and from that you know, taking a look at different, you know, of course, our, our primary theme, our secondary theme, kind of the construction of everything, and then working on the difficult passages in order to reflect those lines. So in a way, I tend to work bigger and then into smaller increments, because especially a lot of those difficult thorny passages, which you'll evidently hear in the concert, um, are quite concentrated in certain aspects of each movement. And then after that, you know, once I'm, you know, working on and I feel comfortable in a place where I can I can certainly perform this the one of the last things I do is do practice run throughs especially for myself um I'm a person that you know like much like everyone else um tends to get perhaps a little bit nervous in performing especially with memorizing and and just trying to be able to reflect an entire work and especially with the endurance of of playing something that intense and also that beautiful and also so fun. <laughs> There's so much to go in that sort of a preparation. So we'll hopefully, I'm sure it will be absolutely wonderful, but we'll continue to um, project that once the concert comes. Very exciting. It's very inspiring what you just said. And I'm sure it's <laughs> inspiring for not only viola players, but even for me, it relates to my yes. favorite. Yes. <laughs> you know? um, thank you for sharing. What music do you like to listen to? Oh, I love to listen to music really of of all genres. Um, I think in, you know, when I'm driving a lot of the time, I don't really listen to classical music so much. Um, I think I reserve kind of my listening of classical to either being at home or doing other things actively practicing, you know, listening to recordings in a contained space where I can have the space to dream up with imagination. Um, other times I love to listen to perhaps classic rock, alternative rock, some things like hip hop and R&B, um, reggae, calypso, soca, um, just kind of everything under the sun, um, especially when I'm relaxing, um, jazz, um, really love Thelonious Monk, one of my favorites in terms of the jazz world. And, you know, some other contemporary groups I love to listen to and just be inspired by music of all types. What is your favorite piece of music that is not related to viola and can be in whatever genre? Oh, well, you know, the, the last, one of the last pieces um, that I heard in person was actually done here at Bowling Green and it was the Ravel Piano Trio and I absolutely love it. It's just so magical and it it reflects so much of what I love about Ravel is especially the harmonies and there's so many luscious colors of it's such beautiful air but so much soul in in that whole piano tree and it's one of my favorite works unfortunately I don't ever get to play it <laughs> because it's violin cello and piano but I absolutely I will be one of the best audience members for that piece because it's one of my favorites <laughs> what is your message for audience members who do not really know about viola who do not really know about Bartok and might be feeling a bit scared about coming to the concert because of the unknown. Do you have a message for them? Oh, sure. Well, um, first of all, don't be scared. We don't bite. Violists are wonderful. We have a whole society of people. It's really fantastic. So the viola, of course, you know, it's not an instrument that is terribly common in the concerto literature. Um, so I certainly would certainly suggest to be open to the types of sounds and the types of possibilities. Um, with Bartok's music, a lot, so much of it is, you know, from his Hungarian background, and it is so fun and is so especially full of gestures and folk and that sort of of sound that he goes for in, in some of his earlier and even later repertoire. And I think you know, to be open to those types of um, of symphonies, concerti, other chamber music, kind of alluding to those things that may not be so common in favor of, you know, perhaps Beethoven, Brahms, Schumann, um, other composers that might be a little bit more programmed these days, but he's one of 
really the great contemporary composers and it's just worth it's worth that listen it really is you will be performing the concert at signatory center with the orchestra but you also have a performance at the uk hospital what is the most unique place where you have been performing in in your life let's see have to think about that because uh, you'd have done quite a lot of performances um ranging from concerti with orchestras just like lexville to you know playing in hospitals um, playing at retirement homes. I had done some actually recently, um, some in Massachusetts, some in Florida, and really performing for um, some of those people that live in assisted living communities and don't really have that chance to go to outside events. And so one of the things that I am really, really, really thankful for is to be able to bring those performances to them and listening to their stories after that. You know, some of them were war, World War veterans and holding really high positions. Some were professors, some were teachers, some were musicians themselves, actually. I remember playing something as a visit in Albany, New York, and it was the former principal violist of the symphony, and she just bawled her eyes out after I had finished performing. And that was one of the most meaningful experiences for me to bring music, especially to musicians that can no longer play, but still want that piece of what they had been doing for 40, 50 years. Um, and to be able to bring that as a gift to them is such an important thing for me. If you were not a musician, what job would you have potentially picked? Oh, I, so I've, in my current life, I guess I've gone between either a writer or a car designer. When I was in elementary school, so that's one of our fun facts is I absolutely love cars. I love automobiles, um, especially one of my fascinating things, things I'm most fascinated by is to go to different countries and to see the types of makes and models over there, especially like in France, they don't have Renault and Citroën as they do over here. It's They don't sell that here. And to be able to see the differences I find most astounding. I would love to design. I remember that was one of my answers in my elementary school, hence, <laughs> hence the viola connection of wanting to design cars and to look at the mechanics of things and to figure out how they work and to see what might be the best and most intuitive solutions to you know owning a sort of thing like that, especially for an extended period of time and to understand how cool that is and how it works and how it moves is something so fascinating to me. Wonderful. What is your current car? Or maybe you have many guys so I have I have several I think the one that is is probably the most favorite is I have a Dodge Dakota it's a pickup truck with a giant engine in it and I remember taking it to dress rehearsals for either a concerto or when I was you know guest principal orchestra in an orchestra or um a chamber music festival and I would show up in this thing that was just ready for a sound check you know like it's <laughs> but it's it's something that I've just had the pleasure of driving um um, it was my father's and I had had driven it for some period of time and it's just been a really, really great vehicle to use. Will you bring it to Lexington? I wish I would. I wish I would. I'm so sorry I won't be able to bring it, but hopefully next time when I'm visiting, okay. you'll get to see it. <laughs> yeah. And I will have one final question for you. What hobbies? I mean, obviously you have a passion for cars. Yeah. Um, so that would be one of your hobbies. Do you have other hobbies or passion outside of music? Oh, let's see. Well, I do like cooking. I do love eating. Um, I love, you know, my wife and I, one of my favorite things that we love to do is to do like food tours in a different city, like especially if we're visiting, just to find the different restaurants and just go on like a marathon of like kind of doing tapas or small plates, go to a different restaurant, have something else, go to a different restaurant, have something else, and just kind of understand in terms of culinary culture, what that place is like. So mm. I guess eating would be <laughs> top of the list for me. <laughs> <laughs> we will have a blast in Lexington because the restaurants are amazing. So excited. Everybody like who has a restaurant, <laughs> make sure that <laughs> comes to see you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'd love that. <laughs> One very, very, very last question. What is your cat's Bartok's reaction when you play the Bartok concerto? <laughs> He does meow. It's I don't know if it's I don't know if, if it's in response to the concerto or because he wants food. It could be either. <laughs> He's a very hungry individual, but he does meow. <laughs> okay, send send us a little keep. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you so much, Jordan, for your time. We are so much lo looking forward to see you in February. It will be on February 18, a Saturday at the Singletary Center, and there is Inside the Score where we will talk again and take questions from the audience. And at 7.30 is the concert with the Bartok Viola Concerto. Thank you so much, Jordan. Oh, thank you so much, everyone.